So it was that when he had returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by training. This is a parable that Jesus is telling at the table of a man by the name of Zacchaeus. Anybody remember Zacchaeus? He grew up in Sunday school like me. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And the Lord said, Zacchaeus, you come down. Go into your house too. Isn't it amazing how those things just stick with you? Beyonce lyrics and Sunday school rhymes. I told you two things that I just can't get out of my head. <laughs> I'm joking. why that's such a big deal and then later but Jesus understands that everybody at the table has the wrong idea why he came Jesus figured out that everybody at the table thought that Jesus was there just to fix their problems maybe some of us feel like that about church I go to church to get my problems fixed oh it's so much bigger than your problems Look at the neighbor. Help, help the preacher preach. Tell him it's so much bigger than your problem. They didn't want to hear you. Tell somebody else. Tell, tell, tell somebody who had a little bit more, more, more joy. Tell them your problem. Come on, we're still preaching. Tell them your problem is actually not a problem at all. You're just not looking at it. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minus. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little. Have authority over, watch that, ten cities. He left the money and exchanged those money, that money for, for cities. I believe those cities was Destiny Church Towson. Destiny Church Bowie, Destiny Church Largo, Destiny Church Rockville, Destiny Church Germantown, Destiny Church Philly, Newark, Richmond, Brooklyn, BK. <laughs> he said, you've been faithful with little, I'll trust you with cities. And then, y'all don't got enough faith to scream with me. Then the second came, and the master said, if mine has earned five minus, likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, here is your mina. Here is your money. Here is what you gave me. I have kept it away in a handkerchief. Because I was afraid of you. Because you're an austere, unrealistic, difficult God, man. You collect what you did not deposit, and you reap what you did not sow. You ever been eavesdropping on somebody's conversation, it got really tense, and you're like, I'll come back. <laughs> That's what just happened in this verse. The master, he's throwing out blessings, and then this one servant who did nothing with this blessing is like, y'all work that out. I'll come back. Sounds a little tense. We're going to pray, and then we're going to unpack that tense moment. Is that okay? Father God, we're grateful. God, that you are seated on high, the victorious one. God, you're not just victorious over sin. God, you're victorious over every problem that we could ever face in our life. So God, on this Palm Sunday, on this day that we celebrate your triumphal entry into Jerusalem, God, we pray that you would enter our lives. God, changes from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If we sit down, high five, two people. You might have to walk for it, but two people. Ask them, are you paranoid? Come on, ask somebody. Ask somebody, ask somebody, ask somebody. Are you, are you paranoid? Next Sunday is Easter Sunday. Anybody excited for Easter? There's two reasons why I'm excited for Easter. The first is this, because if there was no Easter, there would be no Christianity. 
I really thought I'd get a better response after that, but maybe they ran out of coffee in the lobby, so I'll try it again. If there was no Easter, there would be no Christianity. That's a good place to say something. You don't even really know what to say to that, right? It's like, whoa, Jesus died. <laughs> you know, we don't celebrate the death of Jesus on Easter. That's Good Friday. By the way, which is the dumbest name for a day I've ever heard in my life. Good, good Friday was only good for us. It was not good for Jesus. If Jesus named Good Friday, he would have named it Bad Friday, Painful Friday, Death Friday. <laughs> That's what happened on Friday. But Friday was obsolete without Sunday. Because if he had not rose from the dead, death would still have been victorious. We would still be stuck in our sin, stuck in our shame, stuck in defeat. But because he walked out of that tomb on Sunday morning, showed the nail prints in his hands and in his side. Sounds like I'm preaching Easter already, right? It's not Easter. I just got too much Easter in me, so I can't hold it. But because of his resurrection, you and I can lift what the Bible calls holy hands. When I worship God and I lift my hands before God, my hands are blameless before him. Not because I've never sinned, but because he wiped away every ounce of sin in my life in his victory on that cross and in his resurrection. So next week, we're coming in. Some people, I, I don't know if it, it quite gets the moment, but some people say Easter Sunday is like the Super Bowl of Christianity. It is like the biggest Sunday ever because we celebrate our victorious one. And because he is victorious, I can be victorious in every single area of my life. The second reason why I'm excited is because people are more likely to come to church on Easter Sunday than any other Sunday you could imagine. And he's like, well, you're just a preacher. You like preaching to a full room. Yep. Yep, that's true. <laughs> However, it's not just about filling up the room. It's about one encounter with the presence of God can change everything. Any Christian here can testify. It's one encounter. It's that one moment when I realize he doesn't judge me based on my mistakes. It's that one moment that I realize, even though I've blown it three times, he still has a great plan and a purpose and a future for my life. It takes one encounter for your life forever to be transformed. So I encourage you, go out of your way. Me and Pastor Trent were at a restaurant a few weeks ago, and the waitress was talking and blah, blah, blah. And I don't normally, like, go this hard, but I was kind of just feeling I was like, you just need to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, I do. That's not the response I expected her to say. She's like, I do. She said, I've been looking for a church home for the last two years. I'm like, two years? You ain't find a church yet? Whatever. <laughs> you were looking once at Easter. That's what you were doing. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm a little ignorant. But I was like, man, I know a great church. Me and Trent, we actually work there. It is amazing. Said, Y'all work there? I was like, yeah, we work there. Like, they let us work there. It's a great place. You should come to church. And she says, you know what? I'm going to check it out. I'm going to come. I'm telling you. So often we think, man, people aren't, you know, thinking about God or they're thinking about church. You'd be surprised. God is tugging on people's hearts, and it could be your one invite that is the difference between hope and hopelessness, literally life and death. So invite somebody, make sure to register online for your seat. If you have a ticket, you'll have a seat. If you don't have a ticket, there's a really pretty TV screen out in the lobby that you can see all of my face, and you may end up there, so make sure you get a ticket. Before all that, though, we want to conclude this series that we've been in called Too Good to Be True. The mindset or the heart behind this series is that oftentimes we enter church and we enter our relationship with God with an unhealthy level of skepticism. That yes, it, you ever heard the term, it preaches good? Like it sounds good and it's, it's fun to shout amen. And, oh, won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? What exactly is he doing? It, it. Okay, yeah, won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? God is good all the time. Well, he wasn't that good that time that my mom passed away. We, we have this kind of healthy or unhealthy skepticism of, yeah, those are good cliches, and it preaches good, and it sounds good, but that's not reality. 
And what happens is our skepticism actually keeps us from experiencing all that God has for us. The Bible says that all the promises of God are yes, and we speak the amen. We tell God, let it be in my life. I believe that you are not too good to be true, but you are able to do exactly what you said, exactly what you promised you're going to do. Today, I want to talk about how after God blesses us, it's still possible to believe that God is too good to be true. That you can believe in God for a miracle, receive that miracle, and still be skeptical. This passage, Jesus is in Zacchaeus' house, and that's a really big deal because Zacchaeus was like the chief sinner in the entire city. The Bible says that Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. Zacchaeus was the director of the IRS. Nobody in the city liked Zacchaeus. If you're in here and you work for the IRS and you're like, Pastor, I'm offended, you should be. We are offended by your presence in this place. Nobody likes you. <laughs> Welcome home, Destiny Church, the happiest place on the planet. <laughs> We get punched in the face one week. We're going to find out how that works. But the reason why people hated Zacchaeus is not because he collected taxes, but because he collected more taxes than he actually should have. In that time, the Roman government would hire Jewish people to collect taxes from their own people. So this was a slave who was working for the master, taking advantage of the other slaves. And if the Roman government said that the taxes was 10% of your income, Zacchaeus would come to your house and you would say taxes are 15%. 10 to the government and 5 in my pocket. And if you said, no, I read the new bill, I know what my tax, anybody, as soon as that bill came out, you did your calculation to see how much more money I should have coming, and the tax break turned out to break me about 30 bucks a month, which ain't doing nothing but a Slurpee and another stop at Starbucks, but God bless the tax break. <laughs> they said, no, 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 I know what the taxes are. The taxes are 10%, not 15%. And Zacchaeus would say, yes, the Roman taxes are 10%, but my tax is an extra five, and I have the Roman army behind me. So if you don't pay my extra tax, I will burn your house to the ground. So these tax collectors would actually abuse their power to take advantage of these people. So when Jesus was walking through the city and there's crowds of people all around them, Jesus could have picked any person's house to attend. He should have picked the priest. He should have picked the preacher or, 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 or what about the widow with the mite where she put all of her income in the, the, the offering basket as it went by. There was a lot more holy, righteous, good people that Jesus could have picked, but Jesus picked the worst person to eat dinner with that night. I believe one of the reasons why Jesus picked Zacchaeus is because he was trying to make a point. He said this at a lot of the time. He said, I did not come for the well, but for the sick. Jesus said, I'm not interested in hanging out with people who think they have it all together. I'm interested in hanging out with people that say, Jesus, this is who I am. The good, the bad, the ugly. This is what it is. I could just imagine. Could you imagine how nervous Zacchaeus was when Jesus came to his house? I mean, you got to imagine, Zacchaeus' house was extravagant. We are talking about gold tile as you walk in. If this was my house and I was Zacchaeus, my wife won't let me do this, but I'm hoping, I'm begging, and she still won't. I want lions at my front door. You know, how bala is lions? Like, you can't get past my door without lion statues. Nobody's with me. <laughs> That's all right. I'm not going to invite you over my house. I'm going to get my lions, though. Zacchaeus, you walk in his house. It was two gold lions just sitting at the front door. But Zacchaeus was nervous because everything in his house was a result of sin. Everything in his house was a result of stealing. And Jesus said, that's the house that I want to go to. And you know what happened? When Jesus walked through the door of Zacchaeus' house, 
Zacchaeus is saying, man, as soon as he says, my, you can't hide a gold lion, by the way. Like, where are you going to put it? Under your gold bed? <laughs> he, you could just imagine how nervous he was. Oh, my goodness. When God walks into my house, he's going to see. He's going to see what I've stolen. He's going to see this. He's going to see that. He's going to see this. Jesus, I'm just pacing back and forth like a roaring lion. Jesus, Jesus walks into Zacchaeus' house and he says, hey, Zach, what's for dinner? He walks past the gold lion and doesn't even flinch. He walks by all the, the things that he had stolen from people and Zacchaeus is like, he, he restores sight to the blind. I know he sees all the mess in my house. Maybe he's trying to set me up. Maybe he's waiting till we sit down at dinner to tell me how horrible I am. So Zacchaeus goes along and he plays the game and he sits down at the table with Jesus and Jesus eats the food and tells Zach's wife, boy, this is the best beef stew I've ever had since heaven. Like, this is amazing. And the whole dinner, Jesus never mentions any of Zacchaeus' sin. Because what Zacchaeus didn't understand is what so many of us under, don't understand. God doesn't want to come into our lives to show us how bad we are. God's not trying to come into your house to expose all the mistakes you've made. God wants to come into your house to say, hey, I made you and I love you. And I have a purpose and a plan and a destiny for your life. So he's sitting at this table eating with Zacchaeus, and he says, hey, I'm about to take my throne. I am the king of the Jews. And everybody's like, yes, it's about time. Grab your sword. We're about to turn up in Rome. It is over. Jesus says, let me tell you guys a story because you're not quite getting it. There was this master. He was the son of the king, and the king was going to give him the kingdom. So he decides to leave and go to the king to receive his kingdom. And while he's gone, he tells his servants, I'm going to leave all of my money to you. Manage the money, and when I come back, I will take it from you. Does that sound something like what Jesus did? He, he was trying to tell them, hey, when I become king, it's not a king of an army that's going to overthrow Rome. It's king of the world, and when I resurrect, I'm actually only going to hang around for another 40 days, and then I'm going to go on to heaven to receive my kingdom from my father, and I'm going to leave something down here for you called destiny. I'm going to place giftings and abilities and talents, and, and I'm going to put you in charge of my kingdom. Who? Somebody say who? You. He said, I'm going to leave you all that is mine to see what you do with it. And he said, one member of Destiny Church came up and said, hey, I took the one talent you gave me and I turned it into 10. And then the next member of Destiny Church said, I took the one talent you gave me and I turned it into five. And then that next person who doesn't come to church here, they're not members here because that's not what a member would do. They said, I buried, <laughs> I buried it because your expectations of me are unrealistic. Then all of a sudden, the master started passing out cities. So often, we come into church, and our prayer is, God, I need you to fix my problem. And God says, that's not a problem. You see it as a problem, but it's not really a problem. What that is, is a promotion that is loading. You actually don't want me to fix that problem because the solution to that problem is not that it would go away. The solution to that problem is that you would prove that in the midst of that problem, you will still be faithful to me and trust me. And as you graduate from that problem, I will be able to trust you with the city that I always had for you. You're praying, God, fix my boss. And God is saying, love your boss. You're saying, God, take care of my spouse. And God is saying, serve your spouse. You're saying, God, deal with this or God, deal with that. And he says, no, you deal with it. I have put everything that you need to deal with it, not to make it go away, but to bring my kingdom into that situation. And if I can see you be faithful in that situation, then I can trust you with what I really had for you. But I had to see if you were going to punk out. Jesus uses that type of language, by the way, punk out. <laughs> At this low level, a blessing. So what I want to talk about for the next three hours that we have 
is how do I walk in the blessings of God and not be paranoid? Do you know that it's possible to doubt God after he's blessed you? My, my, my wife and I have a baby coming in four weeks. Somebody say, help him, God. People who have not had children yet or haven't had children in a long time, when you tell them, hey, you have a baby coming in four weeks, they say, oh, that's so exciting. People that have had children recently or remember the last time they had children, and you tell them four weeks, they're like, oh, I'll help you. You'll make it. That's what they keep telling me. I'll make it. <laughs> Nobody cares about me, though. <laughs> She'll make it. It's stressful being pregnant. You're laughing. You think I don't know what it's like to be pregnant. You're right, but it's stressful. <laughs> I mean, especially with your first. You go in, and, and, and the, the, the first checkup, and they're like, oh, there's a baby in there. It's about the size of a rice grain, half a rice grain. It's like, who determines these sizes? Every week's rice grain, and it's a pea, then, then it's an avocado seed. But it can't be just avocado. It can be the seed. It's just, just random. But there's so much fear that you face during that pregnancy period. Every time you go into the doctor, they take a test for another issue that your kid could have. By the way, if you're currently pregnant or you're believing for children, let me give you some godly advice. Stop reading blogs. <laughs> blogs are from hell. <laughs> so serious. Oh, my back itches. Let me read a blog to figure out what does it mean when I'm pregnant, my back itches. Well, if your back itches when you're pregnant, means your kid has three toes. Or your back could just itch. <laughs> My ear itches, what's wrong? It means your kid will only get a 300 on the SAT. If your ear itches while you're pregnant, it means your child will only get a 300, which means they get their name right and that's it. <laughs> it's like there's fear after fear after fear after fear. And then finally that baby comes and it's healthier. Maybe it's preemie and it's in Nikki for a few months or whatever it may be. But finally you bring that baby and you have a healthy baby. You would think the fear is over. No, it's just begun, homie. <laughs> they don't tell you these things. Who knew that like the first three, four days of a baby's life that they lose weight instead of gain weight? And here you are thinking you're killing the child. You're like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Woman, feed the child. She's like, I'm feeding the child. It's like, feed the child. She's like, you feed the child. I was like, I can't. <laughs> you're bugging out. And then finally you realize, like, that's normal and, and, and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're okay. And, and, and then all of a sudden they, they send you home. Getting sent home with a newborn is not like it's on TV. On TV, you're in the hospital for like three weeks. And then the doctor comes in and said, you're ready to go home? You're like, yeah. You're like a teenager sitting next to you. And you're like, let's go. And they check the car seat. And we were at a hospital. I'm not going to bad mouth any hospitals in the city. There's only one. But it was like right down the street. And I don't know if there was a backup, if they didn't have enough rooms. There was no room in the inn. Too many people were like having babies at the time. They came in like the next day. Like, all right, time to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, y'all funny. They're like, no, 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 y'all got to go. Y'all got to go. You're ready to go home? I said, no, we are not ready to go home. They're like, well, you're going home. I said, don't y'all need to check the car seat? They said, check, all good, all right. <laughs> Next thing you know, my wife couldn't even walk. They just drop her in a wheelchair and out the door. And we're looking at the nurses like, y'all not coming? <laughs> They're like, no, you made it. You keep it. You're going to be all right. <laughs> They say dumb stuff like, hey, when your baby sleeps, you sleep. <laughs> Stop it. When a newborn sleeps, what do you do? You stand over it and you make sure it's still breathing and you didn't do anything wrong. You don't sleep. You know, are you okay? You're good? Okay. <sighs> because after the blessing, the fear switches from not will God do it, but will I mess it up? We end up being in the midst of a blessing, not able to enjoy the blessing because we're gripped by paranoia of do what, do I have what it takes? You have been praying that God would send you the right person to date, somebody that's not crazy, someone that can spell Jesus, somebody that actually goes to church without you knocking on their front door, and you finally find the right person. And instead of enjoying that season in your life, you're paranoid. 
Are we going to break out? Is this going to work out? Is somebody going to take my man? Is somebody going to take my woman? I go. <laughs> <laughs> you were praying that God would bless you with your own business, and now you have your own business, and now you're gripped by fear of what if I mess this up? You pray for a new contract, and instead of thanking God for the new contract that you get, all of a sudden you're like, what if I mess this up? I don't know if what I have to take. If I mess this up, it's going to ruin my brand and all this other good stuff. It, it does not matter. Every blessing that we receive from God, if we're not aware, we could end up being more gripped with, gr with, with paranoia than with gratitude. Of What happens if this blessing, as if God is evil enough, to tease you with something just to snatch it back. I'm, I'm preaching like I do every Sunday, not to you, but through me. This church is about six and a half years old, the first year of our church. Nobody had more lack of faith in the senior pastor than I did. I didn't realize it until after the first year, but for the first year uh, 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 of the church, people were like, you know, you were single the first year, like, you, you wish you had a wife. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm glad I didn't because she, she wasn't there to see me not sleep one night for 12 months straight. To be up tossing and turning every single Saturday night saying this is the night that it's all going to fall apart. Yes, we've been going for seven months. Hundreds of people have gotten saved and God is blessing. But this is the night. This is the night when I go to church in the morning, nobody's going to be there. They're finally going to figure out this is a scam, that Chris Rock has no idea what he's doing. He actually is 12 years old. He's never been to cemetery, I mean seminary, and he's probably not going to lead us into heaven. He'll get us to like purgatory or paradise, but he can't actually get us into heaven. This is the Sunday where they're going to stop coming. Is that too real? 12 months of not sleeping, afraid that I did not have what it so what I want to do in this last 30 minutes that I have for you, that's a lie to I don't have 30 minutes, I got like five minutes, <laughs> is I want to give you just two signals, two signs, two symptoms that you can realize that I've received a blessing from God and I still look at it as if it's too good to be true. And then I'll help you figure out how I got out of that. First thing is this, write this down. You, 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 you know that you're paranoid when we hold on too tightly. We, 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 we hold on, we, we hold on too tightly. I, um, I, I have a love-hate relationship with golf. I love golf. Golf hates me. That's the love and the hate. Somebody says, you just need to play longer. I've been playing for 10 years. It's not like a new hobby, something I just picked up. My dad got some golf clubs when he turned 50 uh, that was over a decade ago. I started playing then, and um, I, I am better than a beginner as long as the beginner has not begun yet. <laughs> but uh, if I were to be honest with you, I actually don't play golf. I play find the ball that you hit far away from where it's supposed to be where human beings are just not supposed to go. I laugh when I go to golf courses and there's like people's homes on the golf course. Some foolish people actually out there believe that the epitome of arrival and wealth is when you have a golf front home, when you live on a golf range in front of a behind a gated community. And I go out there and I just think, why in the world would people buy a home on a golf course when there are people like me out there playing golf? They said, well, the way the homes are positioned, you can't actually hit the house with a You've never seen me hit the ball. I can hit anything that I'm not supposed to hit. I was out with one of my pastors, Pastor Carlos, and we were playing. He was playing golf. I was playing chase the ball. And he was standing in front of the pin where the ball is supposed to go in the hole. I said, Pastor Carlos, you're standing in front of the pin. Can you move so I can hit the ball? He said, Stephen, I am confident. <laughs> That where I am standing is the one place where the ball will not go. I am safest standing here. I don't know if my wife was tired of hearing me complain about being so bad in golf or if she loved me enough to try to save me from my sin and despair. But one birthday, she bought me golf lessons. So 
I go out to this instructor, it's supposed to be this PGA tour trained instructor. And he says, I'm going to teach you how to play golf. I've seen much worse cases than you. I said, bro, you haven't even seen me swing yet. He said, take a couple practice swings. So I go out there and I grab my club and, and I, I take the first swing and all I hear behind me is, oh, wow. <laughs> I said, what? He said, take another swing. And I swing again and he goes, hmm. Two people you don't want to hear, an instructor or a doctor, say, oh, wow. <laughs> so after a couple swings, he says, I think I can help you. He said, let me just give you just three tips, just three tips, three things to think about just for today's lesson. He says, the first problem that you have is you are holding the club too tightly. He wasn't there that day. I was playing golf, and the club flew out of my hand and nearly killed somebody. He said, you're, 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 you're holding it too tight. He said, loosen up on your grip. Let your, let your wrist move. I'm like, okay, sounds strange, but I'll loosen up. Then he said, he said, you're swinging too hard. And I'm like, where did she get these lessons from? I said, you're supposed to be the instructor. Here am I telling you how to play golf. Listen, bruh, the whole point of golf is to hit the ball as far as I can hit it. Why would I slow down my swing if I'm trying to get it as far as I possibly can? He said, the reason you slow down, overachieving workaholic, is because velocity does not determine success. The point of contact is what determines success. He said, if you keep swinging hard and missing the point where you're supposed to hit the ball, it will never go where it's supposed to go. If you slow down to a rate that you're under control and you hit the sweet spot, it'll actually go further than you ever imagined it can go. And then he said this phrase that I'll preach in a second. He said, let the club do the work. So many of us, when God blesses us with something, we instantly grip it with two hands and start swinging at it with all our might as if God gave it to us for us to create. Not realizing that God says, if I bless you with it, I didn't need you to create it. It's already been created. We hold on to our children too tight. You know what happens when you hold on to children too tight? They grow up to resent you because they're tired of being controlled. You know what happens when you hold on to your money too tightly? You lose it. One of the reasons why people struggle to tithe, to give God the first 10% of their income, is, is paranoia. Yes, God, you bless me. Yes, you provide for me. Yes, you've, you, you've moved greatly in my life. But God, I don't know what tomorrow's going to look like. I don't know if you can be trusted. I don't know what's going to happen. So God, I need to hold on to this as tightly as I can so that I can be prepared for whatever may come, not understanding that it's when you trust God with what he has blessed you with that he's actually able to trust you with more. But when you hold on too tightly... Where I come from, we call it a clingy woman. <laughs> you ever had one of your friends started to date somebody? And as soon as they started dating, it's like they checked their brain out at the door. It's like school doesn't matter, work doesn't matter, food doesn't matter, sleep doesn't matter, life doesn't matter. The only thing I want to do is to be in the arms of the one that I love, and the one that you love is like... <laughs> you end up holding on so tight that your paranoia becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The Bible says this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, for whoever wants to save their relationship, their marriage, their business, their children. Whoever wants to save it will end up losing it. But whoever loses their life for God said you'll actually find it. If you live life afraid of losing the blessing you just received, 
you will lose that blessing. Okay, 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 I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. Don't hold on too tightly. What's another symptom? What's another? You ever notice how certain people always shout amen in church? Can I tell you why people shout amen in church? People shout amen in church because the preacher is preaching about something that's not their issue. <laughs> I'm telling you, busted, right? You better tell her, Pastor, preach that, preach that word. Hey, man, I've been telling this woman to loosen up for a while. <laughs> preach, preacher. That's why I always try to offend everybody I possibly can. Some people hold on too tight. The second thing is this. Some people hold on too loosely. We, I'm going to put this golf club away before I hit somebody. That'd be bad. We have relegated sin to a personality. So when we think about pride, we think about someone who is loud and boisterous and, and, and bringing attention to themselves. We don't think that passivity and insecurity is also just as much pride. It's concerned with self to the point where, no, no, I won't say anything. Because people might look at me dumb. It's the, it's the same sin, just through two different personalities. The person who holds on too tight is just as gripped with fear and paranoia as the laissez-faire, I'm not even going to try person who holds on too loosely. It's the same source. I may mess this up, so I'm not even going to try. I, 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 I don't have time to be nice, so I'll just go right for the jugular. I'll talk to men, like able-bodied, healthy, educated men that are single. And I will try to understand, with all these hot women in church, why are you still single? What is wrong with you? <laughs> I've talked to them. I've talked to them. I've, I've gone and I've found them. It was like a, <laughs> remember the Australian uh, outback guy, all oh, crocky me. I found one. I found one. I found a healthy single guy. <laughs> Could you tell? Bring the camera. Bring the camera. Bring the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, dude, what's wrong? What are you doing? It's like, it's like open season. Like, geez, but just join a dream team and pick one. Like, just how hard. There's connect groups everywhere. Like, what's, what's, what, are you, what are you doing? And as I kind of like dig deep and blah, 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 blah. Not everybody. Some people are just crazy. But some people, the issue is... Mom and dad got a divorce. And I don't know if I can keep a marriage together. So I'm not even going to try. I tried. I loved somebody before and they broke my heart. Or this happened or that happened or that happened. And I don't trust in my ability to keep it together. So I'm not even going to try. It baffles me. People pass up promotions that are offered to them. Like, like, employers come and say, hey, I have a promotion for you. I would like for you to take more influence and, and, and a higher title, and it actually comes with more money. And you, nobody in this room, we're talking about people outside. We're always talking about people outside. You know people actually turn down promotions? I, know, I didn't know it was a thing either. I'd never even heard of it. People, people turn down promotions. I don't know if I have what it takes. I, uh, that's just too much. Uh, no, no, I'm good. I'll just stay right here. Not realizing that it's a fear of what if I mess this blessing up. This, this is one talent servant. He said, I cannot meet the master's expectation. I, I can't turn this into 10 minus like that guy or, or five. Do you notice that the master never told the servants what to do with it? He just said, keep it and I'll be back. We put expectations on ourselves that God never put on us. He said, just keep it, and I'll be back. And, and one turns it into 10, the other turns it into 5. And the guy with one, he said, there's, 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 uh, yeah, he's, he's unreasonable. He has unrealistic expectations. He, he expects me to drink and, and not get drunk. He doesn't expect you to drink at all, actually, but that's a side point. He, he expects me not to cuss people out when they make me angry. He expects me to, to live holy. He expects me to go to church every Sunday. He expects, it's just unreasonable. Like, nobody can live that way, so I'm not even going to try. 
and I'll just deal with him when he gets back and just let him know I can do that. That's why there's a good number of people at Destiny Church that you come every Sunday, you love this church, but you've never jumped all in. You, 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 you've never joined a dream team. You've never gone through growth track. You've, you, 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 you've never been in a connect group. You've, you've never been water baptized. You love this place. But you're just like, <sighs> I'm so glad I'm here. But I don't know if I have what it takes to sustain this commitment that I'm... What, what if I go through the membership class and then I... I, I I miss a few Sundays. What, 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 what if I, I, I take on a connect group and I have people coming over my house and, and then I get in a fight with my spouse or this or that or whatever. I'm just not there yet. I'm, I'm just not ready yet. I, I, that's just too much for me. I can't meet those expectations. Whose expectations? Where did those expectations come from? Because all the master said was, hey, hold on to this. I'll be right back. Can't give you a verse and we'll close. It's in, in, in Corinthians. Can you guys skip forward to that verse for me? Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, it says this. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. Ah. One of the jobs of a pastor is this is not a job of a pastor. I just put it part of my job is to meddle in all your business. That's my goal. If you feel like I am like reading your mail and sitting at your dinner table, then I've done my job. <laughs> so many different people, you, you, you have valuable things in your house. And depending on how valuable it is depends on where you keep it. My wife thinks I am OCD, which may be true, but I, I like sneakers. I have a couple pairs of sneakers. And every pair of sneakers I have, they are in the original box in the original packaging, <laughs> stacked up in, like, if you buy shoes that you like, why would you throw the box away? What kind of abomination is that? Why would you throw the tag away? You take the tag off and you put it in the box just in case you ever have to prove the authenticity of those shoes. You have the tag. Pray for me. I need help, but I don't want help. <laughs> Depending on how valuable the thing you have is, dependence on the storage that you put for it. Some of you may have stuff that's so valuable in your house, you have it stored in a safe. That there's some type of key or password behind what you have. Some of you guys, your stuff is not as valuable, but you have it stored in a jewelry box or some types of case or, or whatever it may be. Because where you store something kind of speaks to the value that it has. Jesus said this, he said, I want to take my most valuable treasure, I want to take my son Jesus Christ, the presence of God himself, the most valuable thing I have in here, let's store it in, in a cracked, dusty, insecure, struggling with anger and lust and fear and prejudice. I want to take my treasure and put it in that jar of clay. That, that handkerchief that, that that servant hid the talent in, it represented his own ability. And he looked at his own ability and what he thought the expectation of the master was, and he said, there's no way little old me can accomplish what he wants me to accomplish. Why should I even bother to try not understanding that the way of the kingdom is to take the most valuable thing and put it in the most broken thing? Why in the world would God want to put his greatest treasure in a broken jar of clay like this? He said, here's why, to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. God says, if I took the power of the Holy Spirit and only put it in great people, you would think it was great people that did great things. 
He said, it's not until I take my power and I put it into broken people and insecure people and inconsistent people and people that do not have it all together that they would look at their lives and say, there's no way knowing you, you can have a marriage like that. But God, I know you and how jacked up you are. How could you raise kids like that? God, you, you could barely preach. How in the world could you have a... God, here we are afraid of losing the blessing that God has given us. God is saying, you can't lose it because you didn't give it to yourself. If if I was good, come come and play, play, uh, Lamont. We're going to land this plane. If, if I was a good preacher, I would have a cup in my hand to show you this illustration, but I don't have a cup in my hand, but I go to a church of faith so you guys by faith can see the cup in my hand. Dragon, hand, cup. See? Come on, help me out here. Hand, cup. You are the cup. Somebody say, I'm the cup. You have a cup? Look at you! Woo! Now I need no water. That might go bad. Now you. (laughs) Cup. Somebody say, that's me. I need something to put in this. I'm going to take your pen. Can I take your pen? I'll give it back. I'm not going to preach anything worth taking notes about anyway. You're good. (laughs) This is you, right? This is whatever blessing that scares you. Whatever that prayer that you're afraid to pray because you don't know if you can handle it. God, send that spouse. God, I'm praying for a child. God, increase my business or whatever. God takes that blessing and he gives it to you. And instantly you're filled with fear because he's given you, I'm glad your pen sticks out of the cup. That's perfect. He's given you something that exceeds your ability. You see how God will just preach it when you even mean to preach it? This is preaching by accident. (laughs) He'll give you something that intimidates you. And you will feel like I don't have what it takes, so I grip it too hard or I pretend like it doesn't matter to me because I know at some point, not realizing that you, the cup, have the blessing, but you're still in his hand. We feel like God sets us on the side and steps back to see what we're going to do with the blessing that he's given us, not understanding that when I came to you, you were in my hand, and after I blessed you, I kept you in my hand, and what I gave to you, I never really released it all to you. I know your child has your last name, but it's still God's child. I know your marriage is between you and your spouse, but the Holy Spirit is still all up in that house leading and guiding you. I know your name is on the letterhead, but you're not really the CEO of that company. God is, and he is the one that is leading it and guiding it. And if you want to get over this paranoia, your confidence can't be in your ability. Your confidence has to be in the ability of the one who gave you the blessing in the first place. I can't hold on too tightly. I can't hold too loosely. What do I do? You realize you were never holding on at all. I was never holding on at all. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says this. If I were to write this, this is what I would write. Here's how you, you don't be paranoid. Here's how you don't let fear dictate your life. You be confident in this. Can I, can I, forgive me, can I rewrite this verse? You be confident in this, it was never up to you in the first place. You be confident in this, Stephen, this was never your church. You be confident in this, that he who began a good work in you. Yes, it's in you, but it's not on you. He began the good work in you, and he will carry it on to completion until you get it all together. Until you figure out how to do it on your own. You know when the Bible says God will quit on you? God does quit on you, by the way. You know when he will quit on you? 
He will quit on you in the day of Christ Jesus. You know what that day is? That's the day you are sitting in heaven right next to him. And he realized, you don't need me to hold you anymore because you're sitting right next to me. But until you're sitting right next to me in heaven, I will bring to completion the good work that I... I don't have to keep myself holy. God will do it in me. I don't have to grow a church. I don't have to fix a marriage. I don't have to raise a child. I have to trust the one who began the good work in me that he will see it through to completion. Oh, so I can preach with no fear. I can parent with no fear. I can run my business with no fear. I can be married with no fear because it's not up to me. I didn't start this. And because I didn't start it, I don't have to finish it. I just have to be faithful in it. And he who began this good work, he will see it through to completion. Don't leave this place paranoid. Leave this place confident. He's going to do it. Say it. Say it. He's going to do it. Even when I don't feel like it. Even when I don't feel like it. He's still going to do it. Because the Bible says, <laughs> you're on now, that even when I'm not faithful, He's still faithful. That's for somebody in here. You feel like I messed it up. I blew it. I've done something wrong. There's no way God is going to complete this because I messed it up. The Bible says even when you're not faithful, he's still faithful because faithfulness is not what he does. It is who. I better pray before we start another message. <laughs> Father God, we're grateful. God, you, man, God, every person sitting in this room represents a good work that you have begun. God, you didn't just start it. You're going to finish it. So in this moment, God, we come against all fear and all paranoia. God, we admit we don't have what it takes. But we're not trusting in our ability. We're trusting in yours. God, you've never failed. Just where you are with your eyes closed and your head bowed, just figure out what's that one thing that you've been holding on too tightly? Or what's that one thing that because of fear you've been holding on too loosely? Whatever that is, right now, just between you and God, say, God, I give you this. Maybe a child, maybe a marriage, maybe a pain, maybe a business. God, I give it to you. For some of you, it may be your heart that you've never given to God. Maybe you're like me and you grew up in church, but you just lived in church and kept control of your life. You never trusted God as your God, and your Lord, and your Savior. Today, God is saying, it's not your kids I want, it's not your marriage, it's not, I want you to put your faith in 